Hey guys, you're listening to the We Could Make That podcast, and I'm your host, Andrea Ween. On this show, I interview small batch, independent food makers who've struck out on a noble cause, making the world as tasty as possible. In each episode, I'm digging into their backgrounds, motivations, and passions to decode why and how they started their businesses and the lessons we can each take back to our own kitchens and lives. Let's get started. If you've wandered around a Whole Foods market lately, you'll likely recognize my guest for today's show, Sir Kensington's. Sir Kensington's is a condiment company that's redefining what it means to make ketchup, mustard, and mayo, including a brilliant vegan mayo made from the byproduct of chickpeas used for hummus. I think it's seriously innovative and very impressive stuff. In this episode, I sat down at the Sir Kensington's offices with co-founder Scott Norton, to get the scoop on why they chose to start a ketchup company in a world dominated by Heinz. We also talk about everything from how the fictional Sir Kensington was born, to Scott's favorite meal, to what he thinks it means to be an entrepreneur. But I've got to warn you, we did record the show in the heart of Soho in New York City, so apologies if the background noises on this episode are at all disrupting. Now, without further ado, let's get to the show. Scott, thanks so much for coming on the show. How are you? Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. I'm fantastic. Thank you for inviting me to your offices as well. It's my first time doing an on-site podcast, I have to say. Oh, fantastic. Welcome welcome to Sir Kensington's headquarters. Thank you. To the test kitchen, uh, the studio, the collaboration zone. Thank you. Yeah. So how many people, I'm kind of looking out over an open layout space, but how many people do you guys have here? We have across the country in in our whole company, we've got 34 people. Though in this office here in New York City, we've got around 20. Okay. So we have a good good portion of our team, which is actually distributed. So let's talk a little bit about your story before we jump into the Sir Kensington story. Tell me a little bit about how you grew up, where you're from. I grew up, I was born in Northern California. Um, I'm very much a Northern California at heart. I was born in San Francisco, and then I moved uh, to the peninsula in the Bay Area shortly after that. So I grew up just a stone's throw from where the hippie movement started, a stone's throw from where some of the first people were putting the internet together. And in the, in the midst of beautiful redwood trees and moss covered forests and the nature of Northern California. So I was really lucky to grow up with a lot of wonderful food, uh, a lot of mix of different cultures in that part of the country and a lot of innovation. How do you think that growing up in that area, you mentioned it a bit, just being surrounded by so much abundance, I guess, in terms of food, mm. how does that kind of define your food ethos and what has that evolution looked like since you found success here? Well, the California, I would say, has two incredible forces when it comes to food. One of them is diverse and very uh, fertile climates for making food. So the Central Valley is there, so we've got excellent fresh produce. And, and all sorts of different climate zones, which, which lend themselves to different types of produce. Though another element of it is actually the fact that California is this wonderful cultural melting pot. And California food is many things together in a way that Midwestern food, you know, is not necessarily. Is there casseroles out there? It, casseroles <laughs> are not, not a thing in our, in our family. And all right. my mother is actually Armenian. Okay. And so I grew up as someone who is familiar with like Armenian food, eating Armenian food and eating Middle Eastern food and and food from different parts of the world that kind of always a little bit cast me as an outsider because like at Thanksgiving, we would also have all this Armenian food. And if if I had like a graduation party, there'd be Armenian food. And I would bring like hummus to school in middle school and high school and other kids would be like, ew, what is that? And then they'd be like, oh, I want to trade you for your hummus. So I was really lucky to grow up in a very diverse area when it comes to food, uh, both culturally and also botanically. Yeah, my mother is Romanian, so different, but she kind of shirked all of the Romanian stuff. So we only had it at my grandmother's house, and then we got all the casseroles. So I think like Ohio infiltrated her <laughs> far more than Romania ever did. What about your dad? What was that food? Was he into food, or was it mostly your mom's kind of jam? It was, uh, my dad did a lot of cooking in our family for sure. Um, and, and a lot of the weekday cooking. And he had, he didn't necessarily have like a, as much as a culturally driven approach. 
But my dad was someone who taught me kind of the basics of like what is a stir fry and like how to make even like a basic pasta sauce, like some of those basic things. I remember I had this internship where I was working at a TV station out in Hamptons of all places. But I, and while I got free board as an 18 year old for accommodation, I had a $50 stipend with which to eat. For the week. For the week. Okay. Yeah. So $50 a week stipend to eat. So I ended up buying like just like the cheapest things I could find, like black beans and like chickpeas. And I was like, dad, like, how, what do I do? And he was, he basically explained like how I could make some basic, you know, pasta sauces and things like that. And I think that he was someone that really taught me that you can use your intuition and creativity and you don't need to follow recipes. Okay. So you mentioned the internship. I know you've kind of jumped around. You were in Asia for a while, in Hong Kong. Tell me a little bit about the story of kind of what college looked like for you and post, because I think a lot of people think that all these people have ideas in college, which I think Sir Kensington came from an idea in college. But then you went into corporate Uh and kind of worked a regular job, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Give me a little bit of what that journey looked like. Well, going to college was really an opening up of the world for me. I think I was being a suburban kid growing up, but being connected to the internet and finding community on the internet. I always had this kind of view of this ever expansive world and was really interested in other cultures and also really interested in media and how ideas move through culture. And when I got to college, it was an amazing time because I was meeting people from other states, from other countries. And so that diversity of friends and experiences really shaped the way I think and, and shaped my sense of curiosity for the world. And it also, um, it enabled me to kind of move my hobbies into, to turn them more into things that would maybe be vocations or studies. And so I was interested, my parents are filmmakers, and I was interested in, in filmmaking, and I grew up around that kind of visual storytelling. So I began to study that and develop technical skills in that, from editing to writing to producing. So that was a lot of the work that I did. And then ultimately, really transition that into a greater understanding of what entrepreneurship is. Uh, for the for the longest time, you know, growing up, I kind of had this feeling that business was typically a force of evil. Like it was this thing that was like this big corporate command and control attitude that was polluting our rivers and it was putting all these unjust labor practices in place. And then when I started to dip my um, toes into what entrepreneurship meant and looking at case studies and taking some classes at school, we learned about um, businesses like dance design and like Ikea and um, like Nantucket Nectars. And it, it helped us, it helped me understand that business has the power to take a good idea that's small and turn it into a good idea that's big. And that understanding that business could be fundamentally a creative enterprise rather than a competitive enterprise is part of my ethos of entrepreneurship and business to this day. How long did it take you to kind of form that philosophy and establish it for the path that you're on? It's a, that's a, that's a great question, and it's constantly evolving. I'm very much kind of a journey as the reward person and really believe in continuous improvement. That being said, of course, I have you know ideals that I firmly believe. And I would say that, you know, it's funny. Nothing will humble you like starting a business. So I felt like it was really clear when I started the business and then three years into it, everything I thought I knew like had been turned on its head and like didn't work or was like proven backwards or like industry experts were telling us we were doing it wrong. And I think really only in the past year and a half have we started becoming much more comfortable living our own ideals and communicating with those ideals first and really being able to realize that our sense of purpose and our sense of culture is in fact a is an ultimate strength. In terms of your personal values and then the things that you also assumed that then turned out to not be true, like what are the values that you hold that are unbreakable? And then what were some of those things that you really assumed during that time that got flipped on their head? There's there's a lot there. Um, I think that, you know one thing that never really got flipped on its head that's a that's a value is treating people fairly and treating people as members of community and as human beings. Uh, that's, I think, a really important fundamental part of business. As as a company, Sir Kensington's first core value is that our secret ingredient is people. And codifying that is something that people always reference. 
Uh, I think that one of the things that, you know, did get turned on its head, for instance, is I really have always believed and still believed that ultimately, as an entrepreneur, what you're there to do is create value for people, create value for your customers, to create value for, for your consumers, and to create value with everyone with an ownership stake in the business. And what, what creating value really means is filling an unmet need and understanding what the market lacks, doesn't have, and providing that. That, I believe, is a fundamental creative exercise. And I think many, most people would agree with that. Where I think it gets turned in its head is you've, you've got something like, for instance, we had a, we have a line of condiments. We started with ketchup that people found really compelling. And you get all these people that try and put into words why they find it compelling and how you should explain that it's compelling. Oh, well, you get people to say, well, you know, you should really talk. It's all about taste. Some people say, some people say, well, it's a healthier product and everybody wants healthier products. So you can talk, you should talk about how it's, 50% less sugar. And that's what healthy means now. And no, 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 you should really illuminate what your process is because it's the how that it's made that adds value. So you're getting all these different competing viewpoints and you ultimately, as an entrepreneur, as a communicator, have to understand how to prioritize them, not purely in a market-driven way, but in a way that, so you can trust the system, something that you believe in uh, and something that you can have a an intrinsic sensibility for and an intuition for so that you know when things might not go the way you plan, you don't need to completely go back to the drawing board. You can use your intuition and your instinct to sort of do the right amount of research, but adapt that messaging and adapt that product. And so that's, that's I think, one uh, element of it. Another challenging thing, and this is the, you know, the funniest, the, like some of the two biggest pieces of advice that people give entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs give each other is one is, have tenacity. When you start, everyone's you know, not going to be on board with your idea. They're going to find it confusing. They're not going to return your phone calls. You just got to be dogging and go and go and go and go. And ultimately, people will see the value in it as you build it slowly over time. Now, the flip side, the other, value, the other thing advice people give you is listen to feedback and change what your offering is and adapt it based on the needs of the market that you learn. And entrepreneurship is a very fine line between balancing those two things and knowing what to be tenacious and what to be dogged on and how you should change your product so that it's a better fit and how you should change your communication so it's a better fit. The only way to discern that is to have an internal compass and a set of values and, and the experience to know what you know and what you don't. But I think that that's, that's another thing too is we've absolutely evolved our product over time. Whereas I think we first said, hey, we need to create something and really stand by it and know that it's different and be able to sort of deflect all the arrows that come our way. And ultimately, I think that what we realize is, well, if we're truly trying to bring value for people, we need to listen to people in the right way, adjust the product, adjust the way we communicate about it to make sure that we're actually doing that. We're actually creating value. We're actually a consumer and customer center. I want to talk a little bit about how search engine got started, but I want to, before we get off of this, talk about, you said the secret ingredient number one is the people. Yes. And I feel like you hear that a lot, right? People are kind of the center and it is, it's true. The best team is the most important piece of any business, but how do you guys really think about that and then install it into the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis? Excellent question. Again, this is, I think, a work in progress, you know, as anything is, but I think there are fun fundamentally ways that we, as leadership, can behave that lives that value and illustrates that value. I think that helping people feel heard, helping people feel understood, appreciated, giving people the space to communicate in their own way of communicating, that's really the essence of collaboration and that's really important for that. So uh, not having a tolerance for people that necessarily will hog the mic or be bullies and really encourage people that are great facilitators and collaborators. Uh, I think that's a really, that's a really important component of it. Uh, recognizing and promoting the diversity of thought in the ways that people communicate, solve problems, meeting people where they are and not just forcing people to communicate how we communicate naturally um, as, you know, founders or leaders. That's, that's a very important element of it. 
then there are elements of it that are people want to feel forward motion in their journey and they also want to have a vision for where they're going. So encouraging people to work with and, and setting a model for working with intrinsic motivation, working with a sense of potential of what you can learn on a given day or your period of time here, because your time is the most valuable thing you have to spend, uh, to work with a sense of uh, potential and to also work with a sense of play and have, have fun in what you're doing. And even if your work is not, you know, quote unquote fun or what you do on the weekends, there's a certain kind of sport to it that the, that path to mastery and that challenge of it is engaging and fun and playful in a way. So role design goes into that and, and listening to people and understanding how they're, um, how they're finding their roles is an important part of that too. So let's talk about Sir Kensington, the dude. Yes. <laughs> Who came up with kind of this Sir Kensington story? Like, where did he come from? Mm. This is another thing that, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely evolved over time. You know, it, it started with um, a friend of mine who was visiting in, oh, I was visiting in Los Angeles, and he was the first person that kind of floated this idea in my head. He said, you know, there's so many different types of mustards, but there's only one type of ketchup. What's with that? You know? And at first I was like, well, this is sort of a, not really something that is a real opportunity because Americans don't even know what's in ketchup. I mean, ketchup's not associated with gourmet foods. And, you know, there's this one brand that's really dominant. And he was like, exactly. Like, that's the opportunity. And then the more we thought about it, we thought, you know, every aisle of the supermarket is evolving. America and American food is changing for the better. But ketchup, this quintessential American food, is being left behind. And so we thought, well, how could we create a, a ketchup that was truly better? So obviously we started with ingredients. So instead of using high fructose corn syrup, we want to use real sugar. Instead of using tomato concentrate that's been, that's been boiled and been concentrated so that all the flavors, um, you know, evaporate in the air, we wanted to use whole tomatoes, you know, real food, ketchup from real food. But we realized that in today's world, it's an attention economy. And perception is reality. And that you've be able, you've got to be able to indicate your value and your position in the blink of an eye. And people taste with their eyes before they taste with their mouth. So even if we were to create the world's greatest ketchup and put it in a normal squeeze bottle, it, it wouldn't communicate that value and it would be ignored because we were going up against such a big brand behemoth, what we call one of America's last remaining monopolies. So we said, okay, we got to be dramatically different from Heinz. If they're going to package in plastic, we're going to package in glass. Use the language of high-end European preserves. And if they're going to be squeezing, which is kind of this indiscriminate use of the product, we're going to be scooping where like every teaspoon and every tablespoon is, you know, precisely and thoughtfully, dearly applied to delicious food. And we said, if they're Americana and synonymous with the roadside diner in the 1950s in this country, what's different from Americana, maybe a little bit more premium, maybe has a little bit of quirk to it. Ah, let's be English. So we created this character, Sir Kensington, to represent the kind of the role uh, of English culture and how it has this affect in America to be really tongue-in-cheek. So Sir Kensington is a Victorian naturalist. Uh, and he's a spice trader, someone that really represents the ideals of pre-industrialized food and someone that follows an odd sense of curiosity to make the food world a better place. So he represents that ethos. And I think that we really designed the brand, the brand around him to kind of speak through this point of view uh, of doing things your own way and doing them with some panache. I have this vision of you and maybe a few other people sitting around in a room, like sipping tea during the day and like eating crumpets. And then at night, just having cocktails and coming up with like the voice of Sir Kensington. You don't have to tell me if that's how it happened, but I really am hoping that that's what happened. Basically, yeah, we would always do that. I mean, when we had our first catch up party at, at college, um, Mark, my, my co-founder and my current partner was, it, we, it was snowing. It was snowing terribly on this night of the, of our first tasting party. And so the, the, the walk, like the, the walkway and the stairway that leads up to my apartment was covered in snow. And so I was like, oh, we have to like, we got to get rid of the snow. So I like took the shovel out and started like shoveling the snow. And he comes out and he goes, you that lad, shovel my walk. 
<laughs> and like the voice of Sir Kensington. And so we, we now come up with all these little factoids about him, like inside of Sir Kensington's cane, which is carved from a narwhal's tusk, <laughs> is another smaller cane. I love it. He's like the most interesting man in the world, but better. He's, we invented him before that campaign. And yeah. when we saw that campaign came out, I was like, what? They took our idea. <laughs> and then I realized, well, that's the difference between what we were doing and multi-million dollar app budgets. Yeah, it's true. So I could see the light of day. Yeah. So you mentioned the ketchup tasting parties. Touch on those a little bit and kind of what research and development, if you will, looked like when you first started out. Yeah. So like I was saying before, you know, I, I came into entrepreneurship through kind of a design perspective. And in the process of design-centered research and design thinking, understanding people's needs, empathizing, and rapid prototyping is a big part of the, the origins of any product. So we thought, well, we could create just one ketchup and tell the world that that is the world's best ketchup, but we weren't chefs, we didn't have any reputation, and we didn't necessarily have any knowledge or expertise in this space. So we took the approach to say, well, what if we were to rapid prototype and create recipes for six different ketchups, assign them all random numbers, and do a blind tasting, invite 30 of our friends to fill out scorecards and taste all these different ketchups and tell us what did they like? What did they find tasted like ketchup? What did they think tasted healthy? Would they eat this every day? And through through that, which was a party, but it was really a, a, a research method and not, not quite a focus group, but that type of product research with the guys of a party created an ultimately collaborative product development process that marks what we do even to this day. So we've, we've thrown tasting parties for every product that we've come out with, essentially. Uh, and have and have gotten our community's feedback on that, and that that ethos, I think it it really speaks to creating something that actually people want to taste and people want to eat. Yeah, I remember someone asking you about hot sauce at a dinner party that we were both at, and your response was, "What does an old English dude named Sir Kensington know about hot sauce?" <laughs> so, how do you guys think about your new product lines? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and what I was getting at with that is brand permission. Uh, is a really, I think, an important concept when it comes to reputation and trust. And having kind of a, having a cultural perspective and, and, a, and a cultural identity, as much as it does bolster and strengthen your positioning in something like that makes sense to listeners out there that an English Victorian naturalist would create a ketchup. I think that makes sense to some people. Like English food is notoriously bad. It needs ketchup. Like, you know, uh, Fish and chips would go well with that. You know, even mayonnaise, I think, is in that realm. But you have something like hot sauce, which is fundamentally comes from more, you know, cultures around the equator where peppers grow, like uh, Latin, Caribbean, or Indonesian. It's it's hard to necessarily say that like Sir Kensington off the bat would really communicate authority in that in that sense. So, but you're asking specifically. Yeah. How do you guys think? How do you ideate then on new product lines? Yeah. We see our, our role and our goal to the market being to become America's leading natural condiment brand. And so we really ask the question, what products will help us achieve that and fulfill that objective? And in the case of something like hot sauce, if we were to create a phenomenal hot sauce and a phenomenally successful hot sauce, absolutely it would help us fulfill that mission. But do we think we have the brand permission uh, or the expertise or the knowledge to do what I mentioned before, which is create something that no one else has created, more compelling than someone else has created? That is really hard to say because there are phenomenal hot sauces out there like a Cholula or like a Sriracha or, you know, the El Yucateco, what, you know, whatever you like. And I think that fundamentally hot sauce wasn't broken the way that ketchup was broken. Uh, or the way that mayonnaise was broken. And so we haven't yet found a way to do that in a compelling way that truly brings value to the market. Now, that's not saying we never will, because we're working on different concepts and ideas and flavor profiles and, and, and ways that we can use, you know, the natural properties of food, um, to, to be a kind of nature's food technology. Um, for instance, with our, our vegan mayo, with our eggless mayo, we we make it the emulsifier is aquafaba, and aquafaba is an ingredient that's actually what you get when you boil chickpeas. 
So when you open up a can of chickpeas and drain it before using the chickpeas, what you're throwing out is this viscous liquid called aquafaba. Well, it turns out that that actually has the emulsifying properties of egg yolk. And it turns out that hummus manufacturers are throwing away thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds a year of this, this substance. And so we've partnered with a, a hummus manufacturer, it hummus, to rescue their aquafaba and upcycle it into the product. And so something like that would be a way to really add new value to an ingredient um, and to bring attention to it and to, to sort of push limits of creativity of how it can use and truly bring something new to the market. And we haven't quite discovered a way to do that in the process. Uh, but I think that, yeah, it really comes down to where is the customer underserved and what is the vision that we see and the capability that we have for serving them better. So you guys have had success in, obviously, ketchups, mustard, mayo, but you've done a lot of R&D, and I read at the ketchup tasting parties there were some fails. So I'd love to hear about some of the more outrageous failures that you guys have put together that didn't maybe work out. Yeah, um, I'll talk to, uh, kind of about two different types of failures. You know, one was, uh, like in our first tasting party, we kind of to just be wacky, we created like a blonde ketchup, which was, I think it was Greek yogurt blended in with the ketchup, and it was almost like this kind of uh it was like this creamy tomato sauce and you know that was a that was kind of a flop because we what we learned is if you call that ketchup you'll get a lot of rejection meaning that like it's not doesn't taste anywhere near ketchup enough so i think that is part of a bigger kind of concept that when you create something new and different and distinct you should lead the market but if you lead it by too much or if you're too distant from what people's understanding of a product is then it's not going to hit the mark and you're not going to get that kind of adoption. So for instance, you know, the blonde ketchup was, uh, was not very well liked just as our original ketchup that we launched with commercially was liked by many people. But for, for most diners at restaurants, for instance, it was too different, a little too chunky, a little too earthy. And so we had to really make uh, some not huge changes, but some very specific changes to the ingredients to bring it back. Uh, to what people need. So I think that's a very important concept is lead the market, but not so much so that you are um, confusing people as to what this product even is. The, and packaging goes a really long way there. You've got to be really smart about the packaging because that sets the context. The second thing is, you know, we created a, a, a tartar sauce and a relish last year because one of our customers was really keen on, on us creating it and requesting it. And we, you know, in that ethos of follow your customers and be customer centric, we did that and we wanted to develop this relationship, create favors with them. And we also said, you know, what the hell? We're a condiment company. Let's create tartar sauce and relish. And while the retailer saw it as a relative success, it was, they were our, by far our two lowest selling products. We hadn't done the, the research with customers. Um, we had done some great R&D work. They tasted amazing, but there wasn't a need in the market and there wasn't a, uh, a big enough group of people that were clamoring for a better tartar sauce and relish. So it didn't make sense for us. So I think what we learned from that is just because a, a single customer is asking for something, you really got to be smart about balancing the resources of the organization to deliver it and to prioritize it in order to focus on your core. Okay, cool. I read an interview with Mark where he was talking about when you guys were first starting out and how he would be like making the batches of ketchup and you were trying your hardest to bottle them like immediately. Yeah. And he mentioned this thing called Kensington Kisses. Yes. Can you talk, tell me what a Kensington Kiss is? Sure. Well, you know, ketchup is a non-Newtonian fluid, uh, which means it behaves differently than other fluids or solids. And uh, when you start, when you make ketchup and you take, you know, tomatoes and, and tomato... Uh, when you puree the tomatoes and you start to cook it down, you evaporate the water out of it to some degree to get the right viscosity. Now, once it gets to the viscosity of ketchup or close to it, it basically, as it boils, will pop. And if you don't have a, a screen on, on the, the, the pots, in the case when we were in college, we didn't, the ketchup would pop and it would hit us and it would burn our skin. And so those little welts that we got late into the night, we call those Okay, that's a yeah. very cute way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so you came up, we touched on this briefly a while back, but you came up with this idea in college and then you graduate and you go a completely different direction. What yeah. was your thought process behind not doing this right away? 
Well, actually, I had already accepted the, a full time job before we even had the idea for ketchup and before we started making this ketchup. And so, and so I, I felt an obligation to, to fill that job. And I was also really excited to, to go and do that. What was um, it? What I did was I was working actually, so I was working at an investment bank in Tokyo uh, doing high frequency trading. And I was working with hedge fund that used computer algorithms to trade stocks. And I was really excited about that because it was about, you know, technology and finance, which was intellectually stimulating. I thought it was an amazing way to see the world, to understand Japan, which I thought had a lot of things to teach me, and it did. But obviously that year, actually, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And that, I think, was a really, that was actually a cool experience for me because I got to witness this moment of crisis and be at the center of something really interesting and witness it from the beginning. And I think that that taught me a lot about what leadership characters emerge in crisis. Who are the leaders? Who are the followers? Do they just take care of themselves? And uh, so, and, then, and I worked for another Japanese bank, and I was based there. And that taught me a lot about how to eat, actually, um, being being there. But you know, when we when we started, I thought that I didn't. I definitely, as a senior in college, didn't have the confidence to think that this could be my livelihood. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really see ketchup as a career. I thought it was an interesting concept and it's sort of an interesting problem to solve, but never did I think that this would have the scale or the, the margin potential to be, you know, my, my vocation. And so I, I worked for, for two years at this, uh, you know, in, in, at this investment bank and or close to two years. And ultimately I realized that while I was, there were many parts of it that were stimulating and interesting. I wasn't really happy and I wasn't really able to fulfill my creative instincts and I wasn't able to get out and explore the world, which is what I really wanted to do. And so my friend and I, we, we, we took 10 months and we traveled to 23 different countries in Asia on folding bicycles. And that was a trip we called Asia Wheeling that we blogged about. You can read about it and see our pictures on asiawheeling.com. Uh, but we went to a hundred different cities and we explored these cities as magnets, as magnets of culture. And we would, we would take these folding bicycles and we would bike around these cities and spend the whole day just exploring and taking pictures and eating food and eating strangers. And then we would fold these bikes up and put them on mostly trains, uh, buses, ferries, occasionally planes, but we tried to go mostly through ground transport and we would go to different cities, unfold the bikes, and get, get on them and start riding. And we would find accommodations in those cities. And so that was an amazing way to sort of see these many different cultures and eat many different types of food and really get this sense for humanity. And the, the, and I think the important thing there, one of the important things of that that I realized is that we are one culture on this planet. And I think it's very interesting that we have, you know, throughout the last 10,000 years since the development of language, even, even longer, we've, because of geographic separation, we've spent all this time and effort creating separate cultures and creating separations and things that separate us. And at the end of the 20th century, maybe even before, arguably maybe even after, we're now actually in the process of going back because of the internet to one culture. And we're all connecting together again. And you're seeing, obviously, the world is a crazy place right now. You're seeing a lot of friction because of that reintegration of human culture. Um, but I do ultimately think that if we are going to survive, we have to think of ourselves as one culture. So that that was a really interesting journey for me that taught me a lot. Um, it also taught me a lot about you know risk management, the balance between planning and improvisation, because you never know what's going to happen in these places. Taught me a lot about preparation, um, about the you know rhythms of energy. Uh, taught me about the creative production of what it's like to like try and you know make a blog and publish all these photos and um, to create something again that people find interesting that people find engaging and try and try and pull out these fundamental human truths and put it in there. So it was during that period where Mark, my co-founder, uh, you know, we had been working on Sir Kensington's nights and weekends when I was in Japan. He would you know we would slowly think about how to move this forward, not necessarily having committed to doing this full time. And we were researching nights and weekends, how would we produce it? What would the labels look like? What was our go to market strategy? And all these kind of considerations. And, you know, he would be FedExing me samples to taste. And he ultimately said, you know, I'm going to do this full time. 
And shortly after that, I said, when I get back to America, I'm with you and let's do this. And that, that was an amazing, I think, moment of going from, you know, before Asia Wheeling saying, well, you know, I don't know if this is a career, I don't know if this is the real thing, you know, to saying, you know what, this is, this is something that I can commit to and that this is something I can create with. That was fantastic to do that. If you could look back, go back now and tell, what, what year is this, 2010? Yes. 2010. And tell 2010, Scott, some piece of advice or a few pieces of advice, what would you tell him? Wow. I think I I would love to give him the advice that things are going to work out. So work without worry. Work with intensity and work intelligently, but work without worry. And that's something I still have to tell myself every day, you know. I think the other thing I'd tell him is, you know, more vulnerably, Scott, you can collaborate and you could admit that you're wrong about something without that being defeat. I think that's really important to remember. Um, I also think that you know, I would probably really remind him that what I told you earlier, what we discussed earlier about the secret ingredient being people, really to think about leadership as empowering people to do their best work and create an environment for them to thrive um, versus thinking that they simply look to you for the answers and direction. I guess in that same vein of people, how has your relationship with Mark, the co-founder, changed since you guys started? It's changed tremendously. You know, we, we've gotten to know each other a lot better. And we always, we knew from, from early on that we had different proclivities and strengths. You know, he, he tends to be uh, more of a structured thinker, uh, a little bit more analytical. Um, and I tend to be a little bit more kind of, I put disparate pieces together. And sometimes that's scattered and sometimes that's really creative. And so we approach different problems and we have different strengths and and so that's really helped us determine over time what our responsibilities should be. And so that division of responsibilities, you know, him really overseeing kind of the commercial side of things. Uh, you know, of course, we both work with investors, have relationships with investors, but he really seemed like investor relations because of his incredible ability to be exacting with the details is, is fantastic. And so, and, and my, you know, focus is more on what what is the what is our mission, our values, our culture, our brand, and how does that identity really articulate itself into how we show up and what, what our actions are both internally in the company, the conscious decisions that we make, as well as externally how we represent ourselves. So I have two questions that are kind of it's the same coin, two sides of the same coin here. The first one is what lessons can small business owners learn from the big guns? And then what advice would you have for a small business owner who's looking to overtake the big guns? It's just you guys, it's kind of your mission at the moment. I think one thing that the small small food producers and small companies can learn from the big guys is to really make data-driven decisions and to use facts and to use research to point to the answer when you can. You know, I think that can often be taken to too far of a degree. Uh, but I, I really think that relying on data to understand and identify your sources of growth and to identify what the needs of the market are, are really important. To, to use those, which is what the big guys do really well, is it's important because it helps you validate your decisions and it gives you a basis on which to pivot. And that business intelligence the and, and the kind of the dashboard that you need to understand what's adjusted if something's not working. Uh, versus just sort of putting a finger up and saying, we're going to do it this way. I think that that makes it very much harder to collaborate uh, when when uh, leadership does that. And I think it, it makes it harder to really inspect what needs to change in order to improve. I think another thing that the small companies can learn from the big guys is don't underestimate the power of scale. Food, produ food production uh, is a very challenging business. It is fundamentally low margin, high it, high volume is required for, for profitability. And what not a lot of people realize when they get into the business is that the channel will eat your lunch. The channel being what's in between you and that consumer. And I think this is why you see direct consumer businesses starting and thriving is because that, that the people that are actually in between you and the customer, they capture a bigger margin. 
they control the placement, the attention, the, ultimately the purse. Um, they're also gatekeepers to this. And so you, re you realize that you, know, you actually have to end up paying a lot of your profits back into access to the channel. And so what that means is it really requires really good unit economics before any of that spend. And it requires um, a scale to make sure that you have the profitability to support your overhead and support investing in the future. That is, I think, you know, really, uh, that's something that it's hard to grasp as a consumer because you kind of think that like niche brands can exist. But in reality, they, they, you need to, I think, focus on scale in order to, to have that margin of safety. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions, actually. What was the process like for you guys going from local to working with distributors and on a national scale? The, well, the process was a lot of, lot of selling, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of unanswered phone calls and a lot of, you really have to, you can't, you can't hotwire the process. You have to prove your success channel by channel, store by store, market by market. You have really distracted and, and, and inundated buyers. And so getting their attention and getting them to prioritize you is very difficult. And you've got to have great people that help that need, that are consultants and counsel to you that have done it before to understand everything from the paperwork to the promotion planning to the way that these people think about value propositions, uh, to selling stories to the retailer. There's a, there's a lot of learning that goes into that. I know we're coming up on time, but I do have some fun kind of great. rapid fire questions yeah, here at great. the end. So, so when you Google your name, there's another Scott Norton who overshadows you for the yeah, time the being. Yeah, so what's it like to share your name with this WWE wrestler? His signature move, do you know his signature move? I, I, no I looked idea. it up. It's the lariat, which is basically just like a clothesline, if you will. Oh, <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. the spirit of the West. Yeah. So maybe that could be like, you know, Sir Kensington's like nephew could be a WWE tie full circle. You know, <laughs> I've only, I think my, I, I, some people say they want to be famous. Some people say they don't. I think that it would be disingenuous to say that I don't want to be well known. And I, I think that, but I want to be known for what I do and for my area of expertise. So I'm, I actually don't mind at all that there's another Scott Norton that dominates these Google results, um, uh, because I kind of like the anonymity and being able to be known for what I do and the, the work that I create, uh, rather than necessarily just for my name. It's but that like is that the, idea of the true 1000 fans. That, have you ever heard of that? Concept? No. I'll no. send you the article. We'll link to it in the show notes as well. But basically, would you rather be famous like Kardashian famous or with a small subset oh. of people who really value what you're, what you're yeah. producing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The, absolutely. The, the fewer people. Yeah. Uh, what is your ideal meal? Ooh, my ideal meal. That's a great one. Starting from the end, it's one that you don't feel too full afterwards. Sometimes you eat a great meal and it's just so, you're like so full and so heavy at the end of it. And like, I really, I think that that's like kind of a, kind of an ugly feeling. Uh, and I, re I really like just being sated. You know, that's another thing I kind of learned in Japan, this concept of like eating till you're 70% full. Um, is it, is it, and eating lighter food is good. Definitely my favorite meals are ones that I make myself. I love to cook and I love that kind of, that creative process. I love meals that communicate something about human culture. Um, one of my favorite dishes to make is, it's called Big Tray Chicken. And it was invented in the 90s in Western China. And it's a, it's a dish that has, uh, I think it's either double or triple fried chicken that is done in a sauce that blends the, the spices of Western China, what, sorry, Western China, like cumin and fennel. But, uh, also of, of Sichuan, of, of Southwestern China, because it was invented in Western China to feed the truck drivers that were coming from Sichuan and trucking things into a newly economically developed and opened up Western China. And to be able to like tell a story about that, about culture, and to like show that this is Chinese food, but it's actually Central Asian food meeting Chinese food is, is, um, I love like telling those stories and kind of using food as, as that canvas. And actually we can link to the show notes as well. I'll send you Mark Bittman's uh, recipe on that. Excellent. Um, 
Then I also like I also like things that require a little bit of a fun technique to make. You know, uh, one is that my wife and I like is to make the Parmesan crisp for like the free coat, which is a super simple way um, to kind of like almost like replace breadcrumbs uh, or rather uh, croutons and salad. And basically you just shave Parmesan onto a hot surface and it kind of crisps up in this nice Delicious. way. Yeah. <laughs> or like um, Hong Kong style spare ribs where, you know, cooking meat, there's your meat goes through two phases. You know, first phase is when you apply heat to it, it's muscle, so it tenses up. Of course, it's edible at that point. A lot of people eat it at that point. But once you keep the heat going and you cook it low and slow, that's where the muscle begins to break down. And that's where it begins to fall off the bone. And so there's a, a suburb Hong Kong style spare rib recipe where you cook the the ribs with this amazing kind of candy plum sauce sh- shell. Um, but you're cooking them on racks above trays of water so they're being steamed as well as roasted at the same time to create this incredibly like hot steamy environment that makes these ribs fall off the bone like real quick um so i love i love things that you know that blend culture but also push the limits of of technique and cooking um but ultimately you know a third really important element is something that showcases nature That's a forgotten part of eating. Everything we eat comes from nature or should come from nature. And to like, to think about evolutionarily, like how, why like radicchio tastes the way it tastes or bee pollen or, um, you know, something like zucchini flowers, this reminder that what you're eating is part of this like larger ecosystem that's connected to nature uh, I think nature is really powerful and amazing, beautiful thing uh, that that helps me think straight and that is infinitely complex and really sparks my curiosity. So I think great meals showcase nature. I think that you gave the best answer that I've ever heard on that question. So oh, thank I'm, you for I'm, that. I'm, I'm, so, I'm flattered. Yeah. And I'm flattered and I have to say I think about it a lot. What is your favorite food city? Ooh, oh, <laughs> this is a hard one. Oh, man. Tokyo is amazing. Tokyo is an amazing food city, and Japanese food is really different from so many other foods. Chengdu is also really high on that list. Chinese food is is so good, but you know what? I think I'm going to have to say Bangkok. Thai food is, I love Thai food, and um, Bangkok, you know, having food from all parts of Thailand, from like North Chiang Mai, from uh, Isan, from the Northeast. Uh, from the south, kind of where you get the really kind of jungly curries. Those are, are, are all foods that you can get in, in Bangkok. And then talk about the, the role of nature, the diversity and the richness and the uh, fer- fertile, like, nature of those foods is amazing. So I love, love that. They also have a real, you know, it's funny, like, when we, in America we get salt and pepper. And when you order, like, you know, even if you just go to a street cart and get pad thai, they'll give you sugar, chili, like chili pepper, and MSG. To <laughs> David Chang's MSG. trying to bring that here. Yeah, yeah he's, you know, I think he's David Chang and Andy Ricker, and there are, there are some great chefs bringing Asian food to America, and great chefs bringing Mexican food to America. Um, I haven't spent nearly enough time in Mexico, but I love Mexican food. It's my favorite. Team. And J- Jason Debriere at Tacombi is a master of what he does, which is kind of amazing considering, you know, the uh, the the owner of Tacombi is not Mexican, and, or sorry, is Mexican, but Jason is not. And it's amazing what he's able to do with that food. Yeah, we just watched the Chef's Table episode of um, In Henry, Mexico City. Henry yes, Alvera. it's yeah. so unbelievable. Yeah, and that show too. also is beautiful to watch, but that, yeah. that episode in particular made me want to fly to Mexico City tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, that show in general, I think, is there's so much influence of nature and nostalgia, and it just goes back to the roots of who we are, right? Mm -hmm. To be connected to the outdoors and to be connected to one another and specifically where we come from. Mm -hmm. Scott, this has been a lot of fun. Can you let people know how to get in touch with you? Yes. Um, You can can tweet at me at SWH Norton or at Sir Kensington's, or you can email me uh, at Scott at sirkensingtons.com. Perfect. Thanks so much for the time today. Have a good day. Cheers.
Thanks so much for listening to the show. To check out the show notes, go to wecouldmakethat.com slash Scott. And don't forget also to rate and review us on iTunes so we can keep the show rolling for a long, long time. Have a good one.